Okay, now let's let the fun begin. Now what we're going to do is we're going to start applying the hermeneutical rules that we've set out. And um, we're going to be studying the text here in Acts chapter 8. And let's go ahead and jump into Acts chapter 8. Uh, let's see. Let's just go ahead and start at 15. I know I said 14 and 15, but it's going to be much more um, uh, efficient. Well, it's going to be a better focus, rather, for us to do Acts 8, 15 through 17. And so let me just read this to you real quickly. Uh, and it says, Who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Now we're going to be dealing <laughs> with a lot of doctrinal topics here in this short little uh, passage or it's what some may refer to as a pericope. Um, but um we're going to first kind of back up, look a little bit at what's going on in Acts chapter 8 in its context to begin with, uh, just so we can kind of get ourselves organized contextually just within the framework of where this particular passage, of course, occurs. And um, we're going to deal with, uh, first of all, we're going to think about our, our, our presuppositions that we have about uh, many of these doctrinal ideas that are presented here. Um, then we're going to begin to ask questions of, of the text. And uh, then we're going to kind of list out the doctrines that we will be considering. Now, I know some of this may be a little bit advanced for you guys. Um, I'm trying to keep it as simple as I possibly can. But, um, you know, so some of this may be iterative. You'll, you'll begin to get into the first part of this, and then you'll start being able to think more about the doctrines that we're considering when we're talking about this. And then we will begin to, and we will also begin to at the same time, outline the approach um, uh, of our study. And all the time we're going to be applying uh, the rules of hermeneutics and we're going to be making sure that we're referring to the primary 10 rules that was given um, as we're going along here making sure that we are literally being, you know, in that we are in, um, you know, compliance all the way through. Very important to, to do this. Now, if you will do this, if you will just devote yourself, um, you know, it's a discipline, but if you will just simply devote yourself to approaching Bible study this way, it's going to change so much. And like I said, you know, we use a lot of reference books. I mean, you can see in the background there just some of my library. Uh, if you were familiar with the library, you'd notice that up towards the top there, those are uh, primarily uh, uh, commentaries from the Jewish com community, which would be Rambam or, uh, and also, you know, the, the Mishnah and the Gemara. There's there, 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 down in here you can see uh, references. That's the Anchor, Anchor Bible Dictionary Series, uh, which was basically edited by one of the professors I was privileged to be able to study under, Dr. David Noel Friedman at the University of California, San Diego. You know, if I moved around here a little bit, you can if you, you can't really see it up there, but that's Greek Dictionary, and you know, which most everybody has that as a reference on their table. Those of you who know about this probably can even recognize some of those books from afar off. And, you know, um, we not only boast in our collection of books, but what I will be using is I will be using a Logos, uh, which is, I have Logos uh, Scholars Library. I've used that um, since probably when it first came out. I can't remember, was it? the late 80s, I think it was, when the first editions of Logos came out. And you don't have to make that kind of investment right now. If you are a pastor or evangelist, uh, person ministering the word, 
um, it is well worth investing in a very good um, Bible study program. And especially those of you who are not um, skilled in uh, Hebrew or Greek, the original biblical languages, especially, you know, Hebrew and Greek, um, then what happens is these Bible software programs, they make it very, very easy for you to understand those original words and begin to get at uh, meanings. Uh, theological workbook of the Old Testament, powerful. Theological dictionary of the New Testament, powerful. Those are just great resources. And more than anything else, it's just looking in on, looking at the words, just rather than spoon feeding anybody, you know, what a passage means, it's let's get at these words. And, um, and so without doing too much more advertisement, <laughs> uh, as it were, um, for Bible software, you've got to get something that is that is adequate. Uh, there are there's some freeware with both Blue Line Bible, as I've already suggested, and Logos. Then you know work towards going ahead and and purchasing something so that you've got the full access to the entire library. And um, you know I'm not going to go back over my our rules and and things, but we are going to uh, remind you of them continually about not being over reliant upon dictionaries and commentaries, but really getting our information from the Word of God. So really what one of the things I do, and one of my sub rules, is I'm always consulting reference books that are not going to tell me what the text says, but are going to give me the resources so I can understand the text, i.e. very good linguistic studies. Um, I want to be able to, you know, BDAG will help me go and start looking at everywhere the word is used, uh, uh, the Greek word is used um, secularly as well as biblically. I'm, I'm you know, emphasis, my emphasis is the biblical usage. I, I want, uh, you know, another one of my sub rules is I want precedents set for words um, as they're used in the scripture. And I know there's people who have arguments about this, but their arguments is because they're making different text types you know, they're making different category types, you know, to, to say, in other words, you know, this is the, 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 this is what the, you know, the department, if you would, of the, uh, the gospels has to say, this is the tradition of the, of, of the, uh, what was going on with those who were part of writing, editing the book of Acts, epistles, etc. So, and of course, we've removed those kinds of categories out of our way uh, in terms of our following our hermeneutical rules. So I'm going after presidents and words. You know, uh, when I get to Romans chapter 12 and I read, uh, be not conformed to this world, but, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I don't want to understand the word transform, metam metamorpho, from uh, classical Greek. I consider it, but I don't want to understand it from that. I want to understand it from its presidents as it's set in a first occurrence uh, at the Mount, what we call the Mount of Transfiguration. And so I understand that word not to be transformed, but transfigured. And it brings an entirely different meaning uh, to the, the text. And so not going into that, let's get into our text. Let's get back to our text. And so... Um, one, some of the things, let me back up here again. Some of the things that we're going to uh, consider in our precept is that we, we all have to always recognize that we come or we approach scripture with a set of presuppositions, okay? And for example, we'll have presuppositions like, um, you know, well, you have to be born again before you're baptized, okay? And um, you have to be baptized in water before you before you receive the Holy Spirit, or uh, one has to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, uh, one, or one is baptized rather in the Holy Spirit when they are born again. There's all kinds of presuppositions, and there's a whole bunch that we could write down here right now. But let's just first and foremost let's just consider the nature of the text when we're looking at this, and we're saying, you know, we're going, wait a minute, what's going on here? Um, uh, first and foremost, one of the things you might say is, 
you might ask the question of the text, well, were these people saved? Okay. And another question we might ask of the text was, well, what does it mean for the Holy Ghost to fall upon a person? Um, another text, a question we might ask of the text, uh, must an apostle lay hands on a person if they're going to be baptized in the Holy Ghost? So, you know, we're going to be dealing with, you know, we're, we're going to have to really back up and start asking, you know, basic questions um, and, 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 and things like, you know, that we're going to get questions that we're going to ask first and foremost from words, okay? Well, let's study all the words concerning the Holy Ghost and we're going to categorize them and whatnot and catalog them, if you would. We're going to compare salvation events. You know, we're going to go ahead and we're going to look at a word, the word salvation. And we're going to gather all the information in the New Testament on that. And um, then we're going to start looking at phrases like believe on the name of Jesus Christ. And the second, we're, second then we're going to look at uh, phrases like baptize in the name of, uh, 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 of the Lord Jesus. And, and so let's, let's go back here and, and let's consider why. Okay, let's go back and look at uh, another verse of scripture here in, in context, just to really understand where we're at. Once again, what's going on? Philip, who um, we understand has the authority to do this to begin with, okay? The apostles had already set him apart, recognizing that he was full of the Holy Ghost, okay? And that he was full of wisdom and, and um, they had given him a role in the church early on to, to take care of the administration of, of the widows and the poor. Um, now we see that he's gone out as an evangelist. Uh, we see that not only was he recognized uh, and his legitimacy as a minister of the gospel, um, recognized by the apostles and those at the Church of Jerusalem, but now the Lord is bearing him witness. And, and so if we back up in, t towards the beginning, we find out that when Philip goes down into Samaria, verse 5, the people with one accord gave heed unto him, uh, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Unclean spirits came out. So he's just following, you know, this biblical rule that's laid down in Mark 16, 17, which becomes an argument once again for many people. Once again, you can't edit the scripture just because you don't like the doctrine. You can't say, oh, that somehow it was added on or it was changed. Well, you're going to have to prove that. And there are people been trying for a long time to prove that Mark 16, 17 doesn't belong in the autograph or, you know, wasn't original uh, to uh, what Jesus said, you know, and they haven't proved that. Really, the bottom line of it is there's ample evidence, sufficient evidence to validate that it is does indeed belong there. And then here's a verse of scripture that just once again uh, concurs with that because the first thing he's doing and we're seeing happen in the context of miracles is unclean spirits are coming out with a loud voice uh, in terms of those who are possessed by them and many taken with palsy and, uh, and were lame were healed. So the, the lame or devils are going out, uh, the crippled are being healed. My goodness, the power of God is there. So in other words, these are the works of the Lord Jesus Christ, which continue to go on and function in the church by the empowerment of the Holy Ghost. And we're going to be able to see that a little bit more as we study the Holy Ghost here in, in um, our word study and phrase study to really begin to understand, you know, the, what's, what's meant down in these verses of scripture, verses of scripture that we're looking at. Now, verse 12 says uh, this concerning uh, the state of their salvation. Of course, we're, we're, we're saying, well, wait a minute. Clearly, none of these people have received as it, what we're going to under, come under, to understand the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay. In this particular context, it says the Holy Ghost had not fallen on any of them. Well, are they saved? And we've got to ask ourselves then in this, que this question, and most one of the most important questions of this text, are they saved? Well, the power of the Holy Ghost was certainly present there to do signs and wonders and miracles, okay? <laughs> and so we then going to have to find out what does a person need to do in order to be saved? Well, verse 12 gives us a little bit more in context <clears throat> because we read, uh, but when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning uh, the kingdom and, and the name of Jesus Christ. So they believed 
the things concerning the kingdom of God, and they believed on the name of Jesus Christ, they were then baptized, both men and women. So, you know, they're following what most people would consider right there, the basic formula. And I think probably one of the more common um, doctrinal doctrinal ideas, doctrinal concepts, doctrinal teachings, maybe even doctrinal revelations that would be agree, agreed upon for the larger part of the various different denominations and groups would be that this is the salvation formula, if you would. And um, some would call it even a baptism formula. You, you hear preach, you hear the preaching of the kingdom of God, you believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're baptized, are we going to be able to say that these folks were not saved? Well, we want to find that out because, you know, we may have some doctrinal bias that says, no, when you're saved, at the same time, you receive uh, the Holy Ghost. Because, we, we, you know, we go back to verse 15, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost for as Yet he, the Holy Spirit, was not had not fallen upon any of them. They were only baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so that's one of the first questions that we want to ask. And, you know, what does it mean to be saved? What do you have to do to be saved? I think that if, number one, if we can parse this out properly, we're going to begin to begin. We're going to begin to move forward in really understanding what's being said here. What is the difference between salvation, for example, and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost or um, having the Holy Ghost fall upon you? And so, to do this, let's try our best to approach the text without a lot of bias. And boy, is that ever difficult to do because everybody already knows what it means, even though they themselves have never really thoroughly studied out what the text says. Usually what we find, and which is very, very unfortunate, I mean, there's value in being taught the word of God, but to be indoctrinated to a place of course, there's value in being taught, being taught the Word of God by someone who knows the Word of God really well. Uh, you know, it's just like any other subject. But to be indoctrinated rather than challenged to verify and prove that these things are true. Wouldn't it be wonderful if pastors, Bible school teachers, Sunday school teachers would, would say, present the Word of God and say, this is what we are convinced the word of God says, but let's look at all of the arguments and let's be objective in our study the study of the word and really empower all of the students to say, guys, we might have missed something here. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to lay out for you and we're going to teach you how to study the Bible for yourself rather than just depending upon us you know, yeah, we want everybody to mind the same things and speak the same things. But at the same time, nobody should be intimidated by probing questions. It, it, that's not rebellion. That's not strife making. That is just simply let's get a hold of what God has said. And the more people who are looking at it and reading it, the more eyes on the subject with a sensitivity towards the Holy Ghost and following basic objective rules that they are taught, it's only going to bring great value and insight. And so what? So what? So so if the preacher or the teacher has to say, oops, I was wrong on that. You're right. I missed that. Or I was taught wrong on that. You know, one of the things that I love about some of the older men of God is like, when I see the humility in their life where their, they, their responses are, you know, I was taught wrong. Boy, I did, I never saw that. Or, wow, that is amazing. And, you know, and then they begin to rejoice in insight rather than becoming all defensive. You know, you don't want to be all defensive. God doesn't need, 
you know, a defense team, you know, you know, you know <laughs> we're, we're supposed to be those people who are on the offensive, not the defensive, the defensive. Okay. So getting back to where we're at. <laughs> okay. So we, we, we have to deal with our first and foremost, we've got to be honest and we've got to deal with our presuppositions. There's a lot of people right now in the church who believe that as soon as you're born again, you also receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, that you're baptized in the Holy Ghost in the moment that you're born again. And, you know, and we can understand why they do believe that because there is a, things are a bit convoluted. When you're born again, we definitely receive uh, a new heart and a new spirit and we receive um this wonderful work of the Holy Spirit in our life. So he puts his spirit within us, okay, as, it, you know, is said by Ezekiel. Clearly, Ezekiel 36, 26, a new heart will I give you, a new spirit, and I'll put my spirit on the inside of you. We know that when you're born again, um, that, you know, you, uh, that as Jesus said in John chapter 3, you're born of the spirit. It's a Holy Spirit, a Holy Ghost, um, yeah, miraculous event and you become a new creation and you become a new creature okay so what we're asking here or what's being presented here is clearly that it's not a second work of grace it's just there is another event of uh, that has already been clearly outlined for us in the new testament and that is the empowerment of the holy ghost and so that has to be what we're dealing with here. That would be my presupposition. That would be my bias already. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to go on a, on, on a, on an adventure here. And, and in this adventure, we're going to, um, put everything on the, in the, on the line and we're going to let the Holy Spirit talk to us from the word. And it is going to demand of us, um, a, a whole lot of study. And so, once again, the doctrines that we're going to be considering, well, let me emphasize this. Please, right now, get your pencil out, get your paper out, okay? If you're just writing, you know, if you're utilizing a computer, however you're taking notes, and begin to deal with your um, own presuppositions here, okay? Um, so, very, very important. If you don't want to take the time to deal with it right now and and so that you can maybe listen a little bit more carefully, just make a note here. This is the first thing you really need to begin to do is to consider your presuppositions because I'm only going to be here, you know, really for a few more minutes with you as we walk through this together. And so this is your homework assignment. You've got to, you've got to go back and, and take what we're going to get started here and and really begin to to develop it okay um so first for first and foremost consider your presuppositions not what everybody else thinks that you're wanting to try to defeat because <laughs> that's what we're, uh, we can't take the approach of strife with the word of god okay we're asking a question what does this mean what are we hearing here i'm uh, you know one person person may say i'm confused they, they heard the gospel of the kingdom, the power of the Holy Ghost is there to save, obviously. The Holy Ghost is there to heal. He's also there to save. And um, yet, uh, and they've been baptized uh, in, in water. And uh, yet the Holy Ghost has not yet fallen on them. I'm confused. What does this mean? And so uh, then out of that, you've got to say, well, this, these are my presuppositions presuppositions this is what i believe it means and unfortunately many people will just stop there they'll go oh this is what i believe it means and you know because i heard you know uh jay vernon mcgee say or i heard <laughs> billy graham say or i or i heard uh kenneth hagan say or i heard uh or i read in a book that this is what uh smith wigglesworth said or um uh, this is what uh, Reinhard Bonnke said, or <laughs> whatever your favorite teacher, evangelist, preacher, uh, commentator of the scripture uh, may be. You can't do that. Or this is what my pastor said. Or this is what, you know, my great grandfather said. He, 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 this is what he taught my grandfather, taught my father, taught me. No. <laughs> okay, so hopefully I have really emphasized that and you've got it. So 
we begin, now we begin to ask the questions of the text. Now that we've dealt with our presupposition, the next thing that you've got to start doing is you've got to ask questions of the text. Questions like, were the Samaritans saved? What does it mean for the Holy Ghost to fall upon a person? Are these two different events? You can ask yourself, well, don't we receive the Holy Spirit when we are saved, when we are uh, uh, born again, um, when, uh, you know, uh, the basic things of how it happened with your life. When I went up to the altar and responded to the altar call and I asked Jesus to come into my heart, was I saved? Is salvation really as easy as Paul made it in Acts 16, verse 31? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. You know, these are the questions that we're asking because if we ultimately say, yes, that's all you have to do, then we've got to understand something that is also needed and viewed as certainly in this text, as it appears, essential for the believer to also have the Holy Ghost fall upon them. And so therefore, how is it different to be born of the Spirit and have the Holy Ghost fall upon you? What does that mean? Is the Holy Ghost falling upon them the same as being empowered by the Holy Spirit? And what are those results when that happens? Do you have to have the apostles lay hands on you? Do I have to have an apostle lay hands on me in order to be baptized in the Holy Ghost? Will that hold up? And all these various different things that we can ask even more uh, questions of the text, but it's certainly an excellent place right there <laughs> to start. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of questions. We're going to get more, promise you. Okay. And so, you know, and then, you know, as I said, you're going to write out the doctrines that uh, we will be considering. And maybe once again, at, at first glance, you just don't have as much familiarity with all of the doctrines, important, essential doctrines, things that we might even classify as cardinal doctrines. Uh, that's a, the doctrine of salvation is huge. I mean, that's fundamental. That's the most important doctrine, okay? That, you know, the doctrine of the baptismal for, baptism formula. How must you be baptized? And, you know, is there different traditions? Is there a gospel's traditions versus an Acts tradition versus an epistle's tradition that are unique traditions that were basically groups that believe different things? Well, that violates our hermeneutical rules. So we're not going to believe in different traditions. We're believing that there's one author who's declaring these things to us and we're not going to back down from that okay so okay now let's begin to take an approach for the study of uh, study so let's begin to say okay let's ask ourselves the question of this let's ask ourselves this question what are the most important words here that we want to begin to flesh out okay and um, then what are the most important phrases that we want to flesh out? And then what are the things that seem to be most maybe contradictory to us that we, that we want to really begin to examine? And so what I'm going to do is, you know, I'm going to create for us here uh, an approach to study. And obviously, it's not the only approach. I want you to consider what approach you might use. You might want to use different words uh, than, uh, or include other search words and other search phrases and other comparisons. But these certainly are some of the more important ones. And so the first one that I'm going to say is, let's do a word study on the Holy Ghost, okay? That's number one. Uh, number two is, and, and I'm going to give these notes for you um, also on my Facebook. And if you're in the class, you're going to get these notes and, and, and other notes as well. But um, uh, number one, we're going to we're going to study the Holy Ghost. We're going to we're going to put in our search engine just Holy Ghost, and then we're going to go through and we're going to categorize everything that we read about the Holy Ghost. Okay, somebody says, whoa, that's going to be a lot of work. 
<laughs> of course it is. And the reality of it is, do you want to understand what the Bible says or do you want to understand what men say about the Bible? They may be right, but they may be wrong, okay? <laughs> and so, you know, why do we have so many different denominations? Why do we have so many different people believe in so many different things? It's not because the scripture is for private interpretation. It's not because the Bible is saying a bunch of different things. It's because people been, became disciples of men. You know, people became disciples of Luther. Luther was a great guy, a great reformationist. People became disciples of Huss, great man. John Huss, great man. People became disciples of Calvin, great man, fine. Wonderful things that, he, you know, he, he, he may have had, things that he may have said that were good. But, you know, people became disciples of John Wesley and John and Charles Wesley. Uh, we can go on and on and on, okay? And, but what we want, it, it, we don't want to just ignore what everybody else says. We don't want to be somehow like troublemakers and people causing strife and, you know, but we want to know. We just want to, we want to prove it. We want to prove it from the word of God. We want to learn how to be disciples of the word of God. Disciples of God, not disciples of men. That doesn't make us oppose anyone. That doesn't make us critical. And if you get criticism here, if you start being critical, oh, I'm not sure that's right. That doesn't sound right to me. You know, wait a minute. I mean, that's, you know, in many respects, that is so ignorant. It's like a person sitting in, uh, multivariable equations class, maybe let's not go that far. Let's just say not, we're not even studying multivariables, you're studying calculus, intro to calculus. And you didn't even do well, you know, in basic math. And now you're saying that doesn't sound right to me as infinity, as zero approaches infinity. What's that all about? Okay, f of x, oh, I'm not going to get into calculus. Okay, now, you know, hold myself back. Okay, the bottom line of it is hold up. We don't want to be that kind of people with that kind of nature, being critical. We want to be students walking in a in a in a a broken uh, and and needy uh, way before the Lord, being just needy. Okay, being those who, as the Scripture says, who uh, are poor and contrite and are trembling at the Word of God. So we're listening in love and we're, we're also studying and researching in love, okay? Now, uh, we're going to also compare salvation events because that really is one of the big things for me that, you know, you would basically look at this and go, wait a minute, are these guys saved? Let's look at, sal let's compare salvation events. You know, let's compare the salvation events as it taught, as it's taught by Peter next, uh, 238. We'll come back to this as well the salvation event that's going to happen later on right here in this one chapter in Acts chapter 8 when Philip goes and begins to minister to the eunuch and the eunuch's also going to have the same thing he's going to believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ he's going to be baptized in water what we can be certain of is that Philip was definitely uh, he, he was walking in that uh, commandment and, and which to me is more than a tradition uh, of the church that he was preaching the gospel, they were believing on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they were being baptized in water. So there's a salvation event that we're looking at, oh, again, in Acts 8.37. And then the salvation event that we view um, in Acts 10.44. And then the salvation event that we view again in Acts uh, 19.6. And there are more things that we can begin to bring into this throughout the epistles, of course, backing up to the gospels. And somebody said, well, why aren't you considering the, you know, the event of Acts chapter, uh, the beginning of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, with the highlight on verse 4? Well, there's a lot of other things that convolute that, that we would have to parse out of that. We'd have to ask ourselves, you know, other questions about the text. So we're looking at uh, salvation events that are a little bit more clear for us to understand in relationship to the salvation event specifically of um, the Samaritans when they're first being introduced to the gospel. So hopefully that makes sense to you. Then the second word that we're going to begin to analyze and categorize is going to be salvation. And once again, uh, we're going to then have to also deal with, um, especially in salvation, we're going to have to deal with um, other synonyms of salvation uh, to be saved, okay? Uh, especially uh, is, is a very, very important one. Um, uh, those, those words are, that would be uh, 
related to being saved, like born again, new creation. Um, then we're going to also deal with phrase, uh, uh, the phrase uh, here that is very important, believe on the name of Jesus Christ, because that back in verse 12 of Acts chapter 8 helps us to validate that these folks believed on the name of Jesus and they were baptized. And one of our questions should be, is that all you need to do to be saved? And do you need to do all of that to be saved? Okay. And does it have to work that way? <laughs> um, is the Bible going to lock down for us a formula that is never violated? Ooh, that's going to be a strong one. Okay. Um, are there going to be two or three witnesses in the scripture of where these things happen in the exact same way to everybody? Or is it broader than that? Once again, challenging questions, huh? And so, um, and, and, and we, we know that, that the denominational ideology um, really trembles over this. They get, they get it, they become fearful. It's like somehow, oh no, um, our people are going to be led astray. Wait a minute. <laughs> the word of God is not going to lead us astray. And people studying the word of God are going to find themselves under authority and in submission to authority. But that doesn't mean that you can't ask questions. And, and, and you also should be demanding an answer. And we should be ready to give an answer to everybody who asks us concerning the hope that is within us. Therefore, that's why we have to be those who are studious with the word of God. Study to show yourself, you know, approved. Those who rightly divide the word of truth. And it's not just, you know, dividing Old Testament from New Testament. It's simply understanding the whole counsel of God here. So don't be afraid, teacher, preacher, denominational leader, there's nothing to be, there's nothing to fear other than maybe your doctrinal bias really is actually, you know, not in keeping with the word of God. And if any of my doctrinal presuppositions are not in keeping with the word of God, I want them to change. I want them out of my life because I want to be able to move on with God. I want to move on in the miracle authority of his word. I want to be in compliance with God. I want to be obeying him. I want to be doing it his way, not trying to, end up to uphold my bias. And, and, you know, and I'm studying the word of God. And I'm studying these subjects again um, after having studied them many, many times. And I'm not going to approach these, this subject going, oh, I already know this. And, you know, I've already got this all locked down, you know, sewed up. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm anticipating being taught of, of, the, of the Holy Ghost, being taught. And he's going to teach us by causing us to more clearly see the whole counsel of God as it is presented in the word. I, I'm not going to look for extra biblical um, uh, information and or believe extra biblical doctrines. And most of us will say that, yet many of the doctrines that we have are distilled extra biblically. And they're from uh, other reference books, other beliefs, other commentaries, what somebody else said. Oh, well, you got to look at it this way you know, on and on and on, the various different things that people say. So real quickly, let me get you started here. We're going to go to our search engine. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to type in into our search engine, Holy Ghost. And there's many things I can say about this. And once again, I'm really into other words uh, that are synonyms, or other words that are used in place of a word, um, that mean the same thing. And by and large, when we see spirit, um, and for the most part, uh, translations have um, given to us uh, the synonym of the Holy Ghost um, with a capital S, okay, so that everyone can discern it. But you utilize, uh, understand this, uh, you want to utilize that, but understand this. The text itself will, uh, you know, make that clear. And 
let me let me finish something too that I was saying earlier. All these doctrinal biases and de denominational biases, they didn't come because there's a bunch of different uh, interpretations of the text and there are a bunch of different texts. They came because people want to hold a tradition a, they, they got some special revelation on a single verse of scripture or they, you know, took and grouped, you know, verses of scripture that um, were basically saying the same thing, but um, they didn't consider those other verses of scripture that were clear contradictions to them. I was helping a person this morning, for example, um, j just beginning to help them. They, they wrote in a, a question and you can write questions to me. I'm happy to help you with them. And they said, you know, look, you know, help me understand um, why a woman needs to be silent, why a woman is not allowed to speak in the church. And, and you know, these, these types of verse, uh, scriptures are, are questions rather from 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 14 and uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. You know, and I said, well, let's first of all, let's just look at a contradiction, you know, and and because we want to gather all the information, let's look at the contradiction and then try to begin to move forward then in a legitimate word study and phrase study. And so the contradiction is that, you know, Joel chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, pour, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And not only will your daughters prophesy, but even the slave girls will prophesy. And so, and that was in the context also of the church that happened in Acts chapter two. So we then got to go start working our way forward from there. We got to understand that there are no contradictions. That's part of our rules. Okay. Just as an example. So let's go with, as I'm saying, let's start our study with the Holy Ghost. And now that you've placed that in your search engine, you will start off and we're going to start categorizing these things. Okay. So we'll go Matthew 118. We look at Matthew 118, we understand right off the bat that um, Jesus, when Mary uh, uh, received the, the incarnation, when she became pregnant, it was uh, a child that she had by the Holy Ghost, okay? So just start off there, that's a category, Jesus born of the Holy Ghost, okay? Because that's important, Jesus conceived and born of the Holy Ghost. Very important role to understand who the Holy Ghost is, what he's doing, how this works. In Matthew 120, we see the same thing. Okay, uh, we see that uh, Mary, your wife, as, as the angel reveals this to Joseph, is found with a child by the Holy Ghost. Okay, so there, there Matthew 1.18, Matthew 1.20 goes in the category uh, to start off with, uh, this is how Jesus was born, came into this world, the, the incarnation, the eternal God, hallelujah, <laughs> became flesh by the work of the Holy Ghost. So put that in a category. And let me say this, you've got to stay focused because you're going to, anytime you start doing studies like this, these studies are going to present more studies. These questions are going to present more questions. And this is where you begin this wonderful journey of learning the Bible uh, from the Bible and praise God for resources I, I like, like these computer programs that we have today. It expedites things for us to really get at the word of God. Uh, but stay focused, write down uh, in a side note, um, however you do this with your journal or however you organize yourself, you know, uh, you, it's good to have a journal where you're saying other topics to study. That's a, a new topical study uh, journal. And then, uh, of course, the actual journal that you're using to flesh out a, uh, a particular doctrine. Because as we get introduced to these doctrines, doctrine of salvation, Doctrine, doctrine, for, doctrinal formula, baptism, um, you know, these various different things that we've outlined already, those studies will go on and on and on. They will grow. They will get bigger. There's so much more here to grasp um, than just uh, those uh, fundamental questions or, or initial questions that we're asking of our text right now. And so then we go to Matthew 3.11, and, and all of a sudden, Matthew 3, chapter 3.11 uh, we discover that uh, the ministry of the Holy Ghost and uh, is is the focus of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. John saying, "I indeed baptize you with water and repentance, but he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire and with fire." So, you know that immediately should start. This goes in a category of the ministry of Jesus and the ministry of salvation, clearly, okay? 
so you know your first category could have been under the heading of works of the Holy Ghost um, but this certainly now comes under the category of salvation and we're now going to be collecting some other words that we're going to have to consider um, you know when we look at the text and it says the Holy Ghost had not yet fallen on them well we're going to have to really consider this um, idea here that is presented in the term uh, baptize okay to be baptized with the Holy Ghost because once again that is one of the words that we're going to be studying here a little bit later and we've got to parse out the difference between being baptized in water and baptized with the Holy Ghost and we're going to see not only from the text that we're looking at right now in Acts chapter 8 those are clearly different especially when you want to take baptized with the Holy Ghost and make it a synonym to the Holy Ghost falling on a person okay the Holy Ghost had not yet fallen on them okay well that's one of your questions right there it, are these two uh, concepts equivalent to be baptized in the Holy Ghost and to have the Holy Ghost fall upon you are those equivalent and then we can hopefully um, as we're going along here just asking our fundamental question about Acts chapter 8 verse 15 we can begin to answer that maybe even fully answer that um, before it's all said and done but as these once again um, many questions are going to pop up. They should pop up as you're as you're uh, going through this exercise. And of course, um, when we start getting in, uh, into a place where we're referencing commentaries on the subject, uh, then more questions are going to pop up. So the only way that you're going to be able <laughs> to keep track of these is to write them down as soon as they occur to you. I, I cannot emphasize that more. Um, and so, you know, I'm not really big on giving tests because I really want people to learn how to study. So my tests really are, are more probing t tests on did you learn how to study? So I like to see people's journals. I like to see p what people have actually done with what was given them. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not going to spoon feed you all the information here I because I don't have time. I think there's like... I think we're almost halfway through the series. I mean, you know, uh, there's only so many lectures per quarter. And so you got to do this. And I pray that you will allow this instruction that you're giving yourself time to, uh, to hear. And hopefully that you then will also give the time that is necessary to learn it. Um, to where that you could wake up in the middle of the night and give 10 rules of exegesis. I mean, 10 rules of hermeneutics, okay? So that you could draw out the meaning out of the Word of God, which is what exegesis means. Remember, hermeneutics is the rules of interpreting, and exegesis is drawing out the interpretation. The rules of understanding the Word of God, and now to apply those rules and hear what the Word of God has to say, okay? So then we go to Matthew 12, 31, and... In Matthew 12, 31, here's the, uh, here we hear something about the Holy Ghost in terms of his role of ministry and in the church and, and a, a warning against in any way violating what the Holy Ghost says. Uh, don't speak against him, okay? Great warning, okay? Just, you could put that in the category of the person of the Holy Ghost and, um, and, and subtitle that maybe, um, authority or ministry in the church well you you can do you know you have a lot of flexibility on how you want to uh categorize that so then matthew 28 19 uh here we go um this is what we would call the it's what some people would call the the gospel formula the gospel tradition i'm saying it's the biblical a command okay <laughs> so the gospel formula is that the biblical tradition or the, the gospel tradition it is the gospel command and now some of you may actually be running up against the contradiction especially if you're a disciple of Bartleman and uh, you know Bartleman uh, basically started 
for the most part, the part the church apostolic faith, Pentecostal Jesus only. And um, so, you know, and, and I have a lot of respect for Bartleman, a great man of God, wonderful man of God. Um, however, you know, if you've got contradiction in the scripture, you can't, you can't eliminate one verse of scripture and, and, or, or, um, or you can't eliminate one doctrine to ultimately have another doctrine. Um, we have to understand all verses of scripture in context of the whole of the Bible. And so we hear, go therefore and, all, and teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Well, that's what, certainly what Philip was doing, isn't it? Okay. So... <laughs> Once again, this needs to go under your under the category of salvation, okay? And you could actually have the relationship of the Holy Ghost to baptism. You could actually put this under the a category of baptism, okay? Very important category. You could put it under both categories. You you decide how you want to organize this. I think it really works well under both categories. Put it under the category of the work of the Holy Ghost. Okay, ministry of the Holy Ghost, put it on the category of, um, you know, the uh, salvation uh, and put it on the category of baptism. Okay, and so it's okay to do that. You don't have to just choose one category for a particular verse of scripture. So um, moving right along, there we go. And we look at the next verse of scripture, Mark 1, 8. And you're getting this, I'm sure. He says, now here we go. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. This is, of course, something that's going to be said by all four gospels. This is the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Then we, you know, so put this under, clearly under salvation. And, um, and, you can also put it under the ministry of the Holy Ghost. And, and so we understand as John was baptizing men in water, Jesus was going to come and baptize men, when I'm saying all mankind, both male and female, in the Holy Ghost. When did that, you know, one of the questions you might ask right there, when did that ministry begin? Because that's very important to what we're talking about. Did that ministry begin while, while Jesus was continuing um, to do those things that belong to the salvific, the salvation of the uh, uh, you know nations uh, uh, while he was in his earthly body, which was about showing heaven the power and the glory of God and the authority of the Holy Ghost to then take our sins upon himself, you know, after having been witness that he is the Son of God? by the Holy Ghost, and and then to bear our sins on Calvary's tree, to then put them away through his own baptism into death, where he went down into hell for three days, and three nights, rose again on the third day, raised from the dead. Is this part of that ministry? Is this part, in other words, of his earthly ministry? Or is this part of his heavenly ministry? When was the first time? Question. When was the first time Jesus baptized anyone in the Holy Ghost? So I want you to continue on with this. Um, I'm going to continue to walk you through these things slowly. Um, I've got just a couple of more minutes. And so um, don't leave any. What I, One of the points that I'm making here is even though a verse of Scripture doesn't actually correlate to what we're looking for, in terms of understanding our text more perfectly, still deal with them all. Something may stand out that some at first you didn't see how it connected, but that's why it's important to categorize them, collect all the information, categorize them into various different categories as I'm showing you, and then um, maybe they don't have anything to do with your text, okay? That's fine. At least you dealt with them. You dealt with all the information on the given subject. Um, so here we are, here we are in, in Mark 3, 29. But he shall baptize, uh, but, but he that shall baptize, uh, uh, forgive me. <laughs> uh, I'm looking at two things at the same time. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath no forgiveness, uh, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Just once again, you know, put that in, in the category of the authority of the Holy Ghost, ministry of the Holy Ghost, however it was you categorized that previous verse of Scripture that really said the same thing uh, in, in Matthew uh, chapter 12. 
And then moving on to, to Mark 12, 36, um, for David himself said by the Holy Ghost, the Lord said to, to my Lord, okay, very important. Once again, under the category of the ministry of the Holy Ghost, here we get to see that the ministry of the Holy Ghost did not just start with the church, that the ministry of the Holy Ghost actually started long ago, and it was the means by which David spoke the word that we have uh, recorded in the Psalms. Um, we will come to understand, and once again, this is another topic of study, that all scripture came by the Holy Ghost as the Holy Ghost moved on in, okay? So that's all we have, time we have for all the time we have today. <laughs> um, somebody says, my goodness, you're really happy. You know what? Well, here's what happens. Anytime I start talking about the Word of God, it doesn't matter if it's early in the morning, late at night, I just get so filled with the goodness of the Lord that, you know, it's hard to do anything but, but smile. Praise God for the joy of the Lord and rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. And this is what this is an important understanding of how uh, to obey God and and move with the Holy Spirit. He's got so many good things for you. If you'll just begin to yield to Him, do what He's doing. Ah, you get to experience all the blessings of love, joy, and peace. The Lord bless you. We love all of you. Have a wonderful day in Jesus' name.